All right, <clears throat> about time to get started. Maybe about two minutes past getting started, but you know how things go. All right, once again, uh, the story I'm about to do is part of 31 Stories for Halloween on Jay Wilburn's Patreon. That is going to involve a story every single day. Now, not all of them will be written on here or edited on here, uh, but I am doing one today. This is going to be a fantasy story, and it will... It's about 7,000 words, a little bit over. I haven't read it uh, since it was published back in a uh, fantasy trilogy, for, not trilogy, uh, anthology for a publisher that's no longer around. The anthology didn't do great. The stories were fine. It just didn't sell a whole lot. Uh, but uh, I like the story. But again, it's it was something I wrote a long time ago. And um, I'm always interested going back in to look at old stories. And uh, one of the things that I do when I'm... Uh, going back into an old story is I try to be careful to not uh, ruin the story by um, trying to make it better. And so uh, there's ways I could clean up the language. There's ways that I could uh, fix every little thing that uh, I may not, may not be the way I write anymore. Uh, but one thing I like to do when I have a story that's, that's old is to just be careful uh, and be, um, particular about the things I decide to change because I don't want to accidentally edit out um, some aspect of the story that was unique to who I was at that time and uh, just makes it into a story that I would write right now as opposed to one that I wrote in the past. Now, of course, if there's something terrible in it that's just uh, just bad, bad writing, then I'll, I'll change that. But uh, usually I try to respect who I was back then and keep the story as close to the spirit of what I was writing at the time. So I haven't looked at this again. Uh, I have it up on my computer, but haven't read any of it. So um, there's a lot of this I won't I won't remember until I read it now. So let's go ahead and get started because it is a bit of a long story. Okay, Hic Sunt Draconis by J. Wilburn. I actually looked up online how to how you're supposed to say that. Um, I don't know if I got the accent on the uh, Latin well, but uh, that's pretty close. The grass ended in a sharp dead line, as if sliced sliced in even perfection by a barber's blade. Golan's mule stepped across the unnatural border onto the hard pan of the outer wastes. The sand did not blow between the tufts of grass, and the growth did not reach over to the rocky barrens. The young wizard listening the young wizard listening as the hooves of the horses behind him clopped against the cracked brittle earth. That should be past tense, I think. So we'll say listened. All right. I already made one fix. He identified the armor and sheathed weapons of the escort party clicking with the movement of the animals, but he heard no conversation as they left the world of green magically, of green magically protected from erosive evil beyond. Golan wanted to look back at the magic border of the kingdom again, just out of professional curiosity, but he did not want the king's warriors to think he was afraid, so he started forward, stared forward, and sat up straight. He heard their rasps of air through their lips. The would be better. I don't need to... He heard the rasps of dry air through their lips over the breathing of the horses. He wondered if any of them were turning around to look back at themselves. Hey, man, thanks for jumping in. I appreciate you uh, supporting and then uh, even asking me on Twitter when we were going to get started. Reminded me to promote. All right, Golan smiled and blinked against the blowing sand. He pulled up the purple hood of his robes, but heat trapped around his head and the b wind billowed inside, hurting his ears and forcing him to hold the hood in place like a woman trying to keep her bonnet. That's a bit much. Uh, that's kind of a simile that doesn't add anything, I think. So, <laughs> all right. Gullen had no issue with women. Oh, here I go. Okay, so I'm here I am again breaking something by trying to make it better. That's exactly what I talked about. Like a woman trying to hold her bonnet in place. Alright. 
So let me leave it and see how it does. Bonnet's probably not the right word uh, for the medieval, but we'll leave it. This is another world, so maybe they had bonnets at the same time that they were dealing with magic and such. Golan had no issue with women, but he felt conscious about allowing the seasoned warriors to compare him in weakness on his first assignment as a royal guild member magic user. He knew minor spells to deal with heat and the movement of the hood, but he thought it unwise to spend his energy before arriving at his destination. Golan let go and allowed the hood to blow back down around his neck and shoulders in a cowl. He heard one of the men chuckle behind him and Golan sighed. The trail wound over encrusted dunes and down steep drops before forming a switchback up the next rise. Gullen expected to see the bones of fallen animals or shallow graves of past warriors, but the landscape proved barren and empty. The men whispered behind Gullen like a second wind scraping at the ground. He cut his eyes over without turning his head, but could not see them over the bunched material of his hood. All right, now, cutting his eyes is a fine phrase, but I, I know myself, and it's one that I tend to use a little too often. It probably shouldn't be in every story, especially if people read more than one story from me. If they keep saying the same phrases over and over again, uh, it, it, it's the same as if I just stuffed them all in the same story. So it's in there once. I need to watch that it doesn't um, keep showing back up. As writers, we just kind of get fixated on certain words sometimes. I know I do. And i got to watch myself, especially in the editing process, to either take out all of them or to um, be sure I only use a certain word once or twice. If it's a particularly um, unusual word, then you de I definitely don't want to use it more than once because it looks like I'm falling back on it too much. All right, Golan turned his eyes forward and spied the dark spit of stone stabbing up at the sky as they topped the next ridge. The, st the tower stood like a needle in the wavering heat off the plateau that stretched out unbroken for miles in every direction. He traced out to the horizon, looking for the calcified fangs and ribs of the beast this outpost was meant to hold off and slay, but saw nothing else rising from the landscape dominated by the singular structure. The distances across the wild expanse were deceptive. The tower seemed to go no closer seemed to get no closer as they traveled along the rough trail toward it. Gullen dropped his eyes to the unruly mane of the mule as his head hurt from staring through the blazing light. After a time, he lifted his eyes and the tower came into focus, showing the details of the wind-blown stone by the shaded side with the sun setting in the distance beyond. Gullen dismounted and coaxed the mule's reins. The animal pulled back against the wizard's urging and caused him to stumble. One of the men whistled, and Gullen showed his teeth. He turned to speak back at what he thought to be an insult. The broad wood doors of the tower burst open at the center, revealing benches and racks inside. A man in dark robes and a cloak lined with stars hobbled out with both arms raised, bone thin, at his sides. His gray beard hung in a narrow braid with his chin from his chin, past his belt, to where Gullen assumed the wizard's bent knees lay below the, his robe. All right. The old man laughed, oh, thank the gods. Gullen swallowed and opened his mouth to speak, but one of the warriors behind him cut the young wizard off. Are you Calfor? Yes, the old wizard declared as he dropped his arms and hoisted a satchel up onto his shoulder. Calfor the Enchanter of the Southern Hills, the man said. Gullen licked his lips and took a deep breath. The old man nodded, causing his beard to wag over his starry chest and belly. One and the same. Are you inclined to tarry the night, Commander? I'm inclined to drop these provisions, turn about, and ride hard for the Enchanted Edge, Master Calfor. The men muttered in reaction to the Commander's declara declaration. Gullen looked from the armored men on their horses to the old wizard. Just a moment, there is a transfer that needs to take place here. Calfor waved his finger in a circle above his head. Gullen glanced up, expecting to see magic emerge from the air, but he just saw dust scouring the stone of the, of the tower from the natural wind. The old wizard said, Can you read the sign, young magic user? Gullen swallowed and looked about. 
He spotted block letters engraved into the stone above the open doors. He suspected they were heat etched by magic as opposed to carved. Hic sunt draconis. Yes, sir. Do you know what that means? Golan nodded. Here there be dragons, or this is the place of dragons. Calfor clapped his bony hands. Well, Hick Svent, indeed. Enjoy your stay, boy. Keep us all safe. King and kingdom, king and country are counting on you. The wizard took the reins of the mule out of Golan's hands. He turned the animal around, and Golan heard the packages and bundles of stores and supplies fall against the hard ground off the backs of the horses. He stared at the materials and thought that seemed like very little to tide him over for a year or longer. Gullen grabbed Calfor by his cloak and halted his progress. Wait, sir, this is my first assignment. You have to brief me on the process and show me the most effective spells against the creatures. Please, I was told you would prepare me once I arrived. The commander cleared his throat. Master Calfor, nightfall approaches and we must away. The men grunted again. Calfor nodded and waved his hand. Go ahead, Commander. I'll be right behind you. Right behind you, I assure. The men wheeled their horses about and galloped back along the trail away from the dying sun. I'm unprepared for this, Gullen said. Calfor pulled his cloak away from Gullen's grasp. He mounted the mule's saddle and looked down at the young magic user. This is a throwaway post, child, Calfor said. I ended up here not because of my dragon slaying power, but because I angered the guildmasters by angering the royal cousins that oversaw the locks on the treasury. Every year they dropped off supplies for another tour in this far-flung tower for a total of 15 years. I have either finally been forgiven or forgotten. Either way, I'm retiring to a cottage on green ground and never crossing the political class again. I don't understand, Gullen said. I just achieved guild member status. Calfor shrugged. I would guess they just ran out of assignments and you were a placeholder for one year. Do not bother the guild with correspondence or requests over the next year, and when the next delivery of supplies arrives, they should come with your replacement. Consider yourself briefed, boy. Gullen grabbed Calfor's leg with both hands. Please, master, how do you stave off the monsters in the event of a dragon approaching the border? I have no training in this. If you have been here 15 years and still live, share with me how. Help me protect the kingdom. Calfor sighed. He looked after the horses retreating up the trail and back down at the young magic user, young wizard. Listen, boy, the secret is that there is no secret. I don't understand. I've been here 15 straight years. Calfor waved his hand around him. I have never in my life seen a dragon outside the pages of a Zulgami textbook or a mural of imagined royal conquest. You're, you've been lucky, Gullen shook his head. What if I am not? Calfor sighed. Lucky? This is comical, young man. By the way, if it ever comes up, do not imply that the murals of the royal cousins are fantasy stories to impress other men after you've had too much wine. They will stick you in a dragon watchtower outpost for years as an ironic punishment. All right, scrolling up. Gullen dropped his head and gritted his teeth as he stared at the wizard's boot. What do I do if I encounter a dragon threatening the kingdom, Master Calfor, sir? Are you deaf, son? Calfor growled. There are no dragons. This is a wasted structure in a wasted land beyond the border of a kingdom that still clings to ancient superstitions. You are standing guard against imagined foes and sunburn. They would not build an outpost or waste an assignment for a lie, Gullen stammered. I'm not sure who this enlightened noble they are to whom you refer, Calfor said, but the royal family would, the guild would, bishops and clerics would, and the ledge and the superstitious poor would praise them all for doing it to keep their children safe from legends. It is a cheap lie to maintain it, to maintain, and it has nothing except payoff. I don't understand how lies of this nature would have reward, sir. I cannot t teach you everything about politics before my escort party has deserted me, Calfor said. But the classes pay their taxes in return for no dragon attacks. People like me can be stored away and punished. People like you can look successful. With no dragons in the world, you will have staved off dragon attacks with a perfect record. Congratulations in advance, young magic user. Perhaps they were merely less populous due to our successes in the past, Gullen said. Scarcity is, is not necessarily extinction or fantasy story. Calfor rubbed his face with both hands and groaned. This is magic and monster 
there is magic and monster in the world for certain. But dragons are placeholders themselves. They were drawn on maps by lazy cartographers and explorers. They were copied over by apprentices for generations. One man draws a mountain in the wrong spot, and it is redrawn for centuries until no one thinks to go see if, they're re ever really, if it was ever really there. If you don't want anyone checking, you write Hicks sent Dracones to discourage them. If a brave soul does check, you simply suggest that a land of dra in a land of dragons, mountains may be leveled from time to time, and you may be next. Then you build a tower against your mountain-eating legends by on the very spot where the map says the mountain used to be to assuage the fears of the people who believed in the mountain and to buy their cheap love. That is how the lies that is how the lies pays well. That is how the lie pays well, son. Now release my leg. This old mountain is ready to move. Gullin opened his hands and let them slide away. The old wizard cleared his throat. Is this not what you dreamed of as you trained to be a great wizard? Gullin shrugged. My mother said I could not make a living drawing, but some guild members do. Calfor laughed. This is true. The elder illustrators of magic tests, text must die sometime. It is likely to be before you. Good luck, then, on all, the, all your quests. Anything else, my future illustrator and dragon slayer. Gollin shook his head, but looked up and said, How do you keep the barren land from crossing... How do you keep the barren land from crossing the border into the green of the kingdom? Calfor winked. Magic. The old wizard kicked his heels into the ribs of the mule and weaved forward between the boxes and bundles scattered around the cracked ground. Gollin opened and closed his hands, flexing his fingers. The... Well, I guess you would automatically flex your fingers if you open and closed your hands. Um, opened and closed his hands. Let me take out flexed his fingers. It's a little redundant. Alright. The elder m wizard called back without turning around in his saddle. Cheer up. You have been you have begun your first successful mission. It will blunt future failures. I would rather struggle with truth, Gullen said. Don't be so sure, Calfor said, as the mule left the obstacle course of supplies and re engaged the dusty trail a few clips behind the other riders in the distance. Also, Pump the well on the bottom level of the tower twice a day, whether you need it or not. It drives fast otherwise. If you have to prime it, it will take hours to bring the water back up again. Thank you, Colin called. Calfor's voice echoed and diminished from facing away and traveling farther across the flats. The water is poisoned with alkalines we usually only use for curses and impotency potions. You'll need to boil it. Filter it once through cloth and again through charcoal, then use a purity blessing before you drink it. I always blessed it twice. You can never be too careful. Gowen looked back through the double doors at the pump in the middle of the floor he had missed before. He looked back after the wizard and mule. Gowen yelled, You were going to ride off without telling me that? You wanted to talk about dragons. It slipped my mind until now. What if you were wrong? Gowen yelled. What if you were wrong about dragons? What do I do what do I do if I need help then? Calfor's voice came back small through the wind. Lock yourself inside and say goodbye and drink the water unfiltered. Gullen cursed under his breath and watched the warriors ride toward their long shadows. He whispered, You ride you ride hard for such brave men and supposedly imaginary monsters. He turned and looked toward the sun around the edge of the tower. Gullen lifted one bag of grain on his shoulder. He took a few steps as pain stabbed at his lower back. He allowed the bag to fall back to the ground, short of the doorway. Gullen held his back and sighed. He stared at the retreating mule and scanned in a full circle around the empty wasteland. He thought about the colorful inks of dragons in his picture books as a child that he copied as he learned to draw. Gullen recalled the medical detail in these study texts as the guild candidate with detail is sharp okay let me read that again that sentence is a little awkward Gullen recalled the medical detail in his study texts as a guild candidate with detail as sharp as the kingdom border okay until in his study text let's make that one sentence 
as a guild member. Okay. Golan recalled the medical text and his the medical detail in his study text at the guild. The detail was as sharp as the kingdom border. Okay, that's a little clearer. Got a little too fancy for my own good. Golan licked his lips. I suppose I have nothing to save my energy for today. I might as well save my back. He whispered the words in a hiss that echoed into and back from the ether in a tone that only came from ev evoking magic. The packages lift up, lifted up from the hard pan. Grain leaked from a, cor a torn corner of the bag that he had dropped. Golan waved his palm forward and the supplies obeyed. obeyed. I'll put a comma there. Golan waved his palms forward and the supplies obeyed, drifting through the double doors into the tower. As the pieces passed him, his ropes billowed up from his body from the feedback of the levitation spell. A trail of grain drew a line from the, bar from the bearing ground into the flagstones of the tower. Gullen flicked a finger to lower the bags to keep from losing anymore. Now, I threw that scene in specifically to show that magic is real in this world, even though they're, they um, are saying the dragons are not. I can't save the people, but I can spare some grain at least. He followed the other, he followed the other airborne packages inside to see if any needed to be lifted into the lofts or the other levels of the tower. He looked up the spiral of the staircase corkscrewed up the wall toward the top of the tower through one wooden platform after another. He knew the stairs of the towers always spiraled with the wall to the right to foil right-handed swordsmen trying to invade up the stairs as defending swordsmen retreated. Golan couldn't imagine any force wanting this tower. He turned inside and took another look at the mule and his drawn shadow. Nothing to worry about while I'm on watch. He pulled the doors closed and dropped the latch. All right, we got a scene break. Golan was too far from the tower to get back in time. He closed his sketchbook and capped the ink bottles. He gathered his brushes into his fist. He shook his head and whispered, What are you doing? Run! Golan heard the roar sweep up from the valley. The wings moved more rapidly than he could follow with a piercing buzz. The shadows swept over the ground below, the wi below, and the wizard turned to run. The tip of the structure came into view as he tried to cover the ground from his explorations. Gullen wheezed, from air, wheezed for air. I wasn't prepared for this. He heard the buzz increase behind him as the creature soared up into the air over the wide flats of the plateau. Gullen turned and set down his drawing implements. He stared up at the swarm of locusts spreading across the sky as they swept above him. They aren't dragons. This is not my assignment. Golan looked out across the pulsing shadows over the dry ground. He wondered what they ate coming from even deeper in the barren wastes. He swallowed. Maybe this is why the land over the border is lifeless. He turned and looked east, past the tower, knowing that the first farms were within walking distance of the magic border. All right within the magic border there stood no wards to keep living creatures from crossing the line this swarm would prove far more costly to the farmers than the fires of a dragon <laughs> thanks man all right gullin showed his teeth and peered up into the living darkness of the swarm a few exoskeletons drifted down around him like snow as he watched he raised his hands above his head and sprayed his fingers open. I can do something. His lips twitched as he spoke the words. They echoed off the unseen ether around him with magical force. He felt the majority of his energy exit his fingers as he completed the phrase. Gullen swept his hands north and watched the vanguard of the swarm wash to the side in a vast spiral. Gullen dropped to his knees and gasped for breath as his heart thudded in his chest. He watched and waited. He knew he could not cast a spell across a hundred million insects. A grand magician older than Calfor might be able, but, not, but Gullen doubted it. 
Gullen concentrated his power over the first few thousand and hoped. The swarm followed the temporarily enchanted locust, and the entire population detoured sideways from their original path. Gullen smiled, but gritted his teeth. It won't last. The creatures might continue on even after the influence of the spell left them, but he doubted it. Hunger and instinct were powerful spells, too. He lowered his head and cupped his hands. Gullen focused his remaining energy. He felt the thinness of his reserve, so he cupped his hands closer together. A spectrum of light gathered in the pocket of his hands, like a tiny rainbow. He whispered into the ball of light with an echo. The light formed a tiny pigeon. Gullen opened his hands, and the transparent bird blinked its eyes. The bird stretched its rainbow wings and waited. Gullen set the bird on his shoulders and tore a page out of his sketchbook. He took the ink, he took the blue ink and dipped the brush. Gullen halted above the paper. Gullen halted above the paper, rested on the broken ground. Let's say the paper resting on the broken ground. That's a little clearer. A single cobalt drip fell on the blank page. He looked up and watched the swarm detouring north. He thought it was possible. They might continue north. Even if they didn't, the locusts were not his assignment, and warning might do little good. Calfor had warned against bothering the guild with correspondence. I should probably capitalize guild. I don't know how many times I've passed that. That may be a search and replace kind of thing. Correspondence. Go inside and toll told the locusts, I have no stomach for politics. If trying to help people results in another year of barren ground, I will just practice my drawing for another year. He bowed his head and wrote three sentences about the locust swarm from the west. He set down the brush and rolled up the note like a miniature scroll. He wrapped it around the conjured bird's leg. Golan ripped the ends and slid them together to form a clasp. You know the way to the magic guild, little friend. The bird answered by twisting into the sky. The light from the sun obscured the bird's body as it fluttered toward the tower and beyond. Gullen heard another thundering coming from the west. He looked up and saw the swarm thinning out as they veered away from Gullen. He saw, he saw dust rising up from the edge of the plateau. The beast turned. The beast topped the edge and stumbled forward, jostling one an one another as they approached Gollin's position. He stared until he could make out the stripes on the short fur and the needle teeth and the long snouts. Jackals, he whispered. I will punch Calfor in the mouth when I return to the kingdom. His breath caught in his throat. <clears throat> as he as the pack charged forward, he saw the glisten of blood in their hides. Bone showed through open wounds as they staggered in their desperate runs. What is this? Locusts don't eat flesh, do they? Why would the pack run the same direction as the swarm then? Gowen took a deep breath to still himself and muster his power. He echoed the words off the ether and threw his hands toward the south. The beasts were hideous, but Gowen did not want to send them after the locusts that may have devoured them. A few of the creatures turned, but most charged on. Gowen saw the whites of their eyes and a few empty sockets too. Foam leaked from the sides of their black lips as they pumped their legs in blind rage. This isn't good. Gullen closed his fists and threw them out in front of him. He echoed a short, familiar phrase. Flame boiled off his knuckles and, and crackled above the ground in two intense spouts. The fire flashed over the jackals and sizzled their torn fur. As they screamed, Gullen closed his eyes. The flame tapered, and Gullen clutched his chest, waiting for the burn to subside. A few of the beasts collapsed, but the others parted and passed the wizard on both sides. Dust billowed up around him and over him as the abused pack scrambled toward the tower. He tried to re remember if he could, had closed the door. He hoped so. Gowen stared in the silence at the bodies smoldering on the ground in front of him. He thought there would soon be bones on the landscape like he expected when he first arrived. Days of silence, and now this. The next noise was higher pitched. Gowen stood and stared toward the west again. Rats scurried up over the edge like a wave washing up from the horizon. He flexed his hands and felt the weakness, weak emptiness 
of having spent his energy on four spells in rapid succession. Their bodies twisted around one another in black mass with whipping pink tails. They pour... I need to make that past tense. They poured forward, swallowing the ground. He shook his head. I never even wanted to be a magic user. Golan snatched up his book and brushes and ran for the tower. The heartburn stabbed at his chest, but he bump, pumped his arms and tried to keep from tripping inside his robes. Golan wondered if the jackal's bodies might slow the rodents and buy him an extra, a few extra seconds. It wasn't the locusts that tore into the fleeing jackals. He could not remember if he left the doors to the tower open, but now he hoped he had. Sunlight glinted off the lenses of the spy glass as Golan... Again, we're new saying... Sunlight glinted off the lenses of the spyglass as Golan leaned out to the third level window of the tower. He could tell the cloud did not consist of locusts, but he could not identify the creatures yet. The rats had passed by a week ago. Golan had finally gotten the last of the stragglers out of his grain and then sent a second bird, but had heard nothing back from the guild. Again, let me capitalize that. All right. He did not want to expend power before he knew what plague was visiting visiting upon his outpost this time. Golan wondered where from where the animals out of the west were originating. They gave all the signs of being natural beasts, but they fled across the land with no apparent capacity to support life and from even deeper in the wasteland. Golan had grown up in the fields owned by the nobles of the kingdom and knew the process of the natural processes in the natural world the seasonal changes and even the rare migrations of, un of unusual animals none of these fell into the those categories of known things he lowered the glass and watched the pattern of swirling mass pattern in the swirling mass of flying creatures Golan squinted and thought about the chimney swallows he had seen flying up and diving down in the openings in the barns of his father's indentured land. That's not a swarm. This is a flock. It is not dark enough to be bats. He brought the glass back up and focused out to try to spy individuals within the flock. He saw the feathers and the shapes of the bellies. He spotted the speckled pattern within the stripes and inhaled sharply. Not possible. Golan slammed the window shut and charged up the spiral of the stairs, closing all the windows, one on the way up. He opened the trap door on the precipice of the tower and took out took one look to the west, seeing the mass of birds rushing on him like a moving wall. Golan yanked the door closed and listened as they struck listened to them strike and scrape against the outside curve of the tower. A few thunked against the door above his head. The noise around the tower faded and a few screeches remained. Golan pushed the trap door open gradually. He stood at the rampart and looked east as the impossible flock retreated. He looked down and lifted up the body, lifted up one of the bodies off the floor of the t of the watchtower's roof. The bird's fragile neck was twisted at a deadly angle, and one wing folded broken behind it. He stroked his thumb over its belly, looking at the feathers. He shook his head and squinted. Gullen swallowed and whispered, "That should be a comma." the speckled hash carrier, as I live and breathe. He recalled plucking them in large piles for holiday meals when he was very young. By the time he was old enough to hunt alone, there was not a one to be found in the forests around the fields due to the generations of heavy hunting. Once he was a young man, reports were they had even vanished from the shores of the eastern sea. Every time he ate quail, his belly missed the meat of the speckled hashed. He set the body down on the battlement and stared east again. No need to send warning of such a delicious plague. Gullen shook his head. He remembered looking at the western edges of his maps in his studies to see the artist's drawings of dragons. He wondered what else lay beyond the three-word warnings over the wasteland where the maps ended. If there were natural fauna like locusts, jackals, and rats, there had to be flora and unpoisoned water. If the speckled hashes migrated, there must be an, another ocean and a hospitable shore on which to land. Hospitable shores surely had fishing villages of some creature resembling man or some other manner of tribes. 
Gullen figured there might be pirates or raiders preying on those shores as well. The Forbidden West might contain all sorts of rare and supposedly extinct creatures. Something is driving them out of the West, though. Gullen turned and looked away from the sunrise. As he did, he suddenly wished he had brought the spyglass at the same time he was glad he'd forgotten it. Gullen swallowed and cupped his hands around his eyes to stare up at the motion in the sky. What surprised him most was the stark white of the body. He expected green or red. Artists and illustrators had chosen a wide range of colors for the beasts in the text panels, but white was rare because of the lack of flair, Gullen supposed. He felt plenty impressed upon seeing the white dragon at that moment. Against the blue sky, the scales and spikes shone with intense detail. The sharp tail whipped from side to side as the thick wings drummed low and deep against the air. The fans and flaps around its white skull made its head appear skeletal as it dropped its jaw and showed jagged fangs. The black slits under its eyes were the only distinct breaks in its colorless form, and they stared down at Gullen upon the tower as it undulated through the sky like a serpent upon the sea. Gullen shook. Calfor should have be quartered by the guild in the guild courtyard. Gullen ran pages of spells through his mind that consisted of little more than parlor tricks. He thought about dozen, a dozen curses that required plants in order to, to gather ingredients. He turned his eyes away from the beast and considered locking himself in the tower with the poison well. Gullen lifted his hands and echoed the words he had used against the locusts. He swept his hands to the side and saw the monster falter in the air. For a moment, Gullen thought he might actually see the dragon turn and fly back the other way. No one will believe me. The black slits of its eyes widened and the white dragon dove toward the tower. It folded its wings back against its body and the flesh behind its head widened like tumors. Smoke leaked from its nostrils as its jaws unhinged. Flame erupted over its lips and preceded the dragon like a torrent. Gullen dropped back through the trap door and slammed it closed. He heard the flames wash over the tower. He sweated in his robes from the intense heat and saw the air waver around him. The noise subsided, but Gullen waited. He reached up and cried out as he touched the heat of the door handle. He closed his fist against his chest and bit his lip. Gullen threw his shoulder against the wood and knocked the door open. Black carbon coated every inch of the tower. Gullen stepped out and turned in a full circle. His boots scuffed the greasy ash back down to the gray of the stone that looked bright in comparison to the blackness left by, the dra by dragon fires. The young wizard spotted the creature pulsing up and down in the sky as it flew on eastward with no further interest in Gullen or his lonely tower. Gullen threw his fists and echoed a short phrase. A, s a shallow burst of flame shot from his knuckles over the edge of the tower, but came nowhere near the dragon heading toward the kingdom. Gullen dropped his fists and clutched his chest with from the burning pain. I didn't even want to be a wizard. If my father had lived, I could be on a small square of a rich noble's farm now, waiting on you to come eat us and our livestock, you monster. Gullen rolled his head and tried to think. In desperation, he spread his hands and closed his eyes. He reached out to the beast's terrible skull with his mind and whispered the words against the ether between them. The connection struck Gullen like a waterfall. He screamed and fell to his back <clears throat> on the sticky soot without realizing he had dropped. The ancient mind of the dragon proved far more intense for Gullen's synapses to process. Far too intense intense for Gullen's synapses to process. The languages of the creature's thoughts were alien to Gullen, and the beast layered his mental processes around formulas and equations that exceeded anything Gullen could imagine. Gullen pushed away and broke the spell. He was still screaming when he realized he stared up at the sky from his back. Gullen sat up and spotted the dragon that flew on unaware that Gullen's small mind had touched him at all. He tried to remember any of it, but all Gullen could recall was broken slumber, evil kingdom, and bed of gold. Gullen shook his head as it throbbed. He wiped his hand under his nose and came back with blood. He watched the white body silhouette, silhouette into black as it approached the morning sun, 
and the unsuspecting border of which Gullin assumed was the evil kingdom the ancient creature sought to make his bed of gold inside. He tried to recall everything he had read on the hoarding behavior of dragons and their hibernation cycles. He considered sleep spells, even he considered sleep spells and every bit of dark magic he had learned, but Gullin could think of nothing powerful enough to bring down the dragon, and the creature drew further you don't draw further away, you draw towards the creature, well, let's just make it simple. The creature flew further away with every moment. All right. He did not even know, he did not even know I was there when I tried to infiltrate his mind. Go and considered for a moment. Maybe I can push an idea in, in instead of trying to take over the entire works. Golan wiped the last of the blood from under his nose and spoke the words again. This time he felt the connection, but did not try to be the master of the mind itself. He felt the connection through the ether, but it grew weaker with every flap of the dragon's wings. Golan licked his lips and tried to think of what to say. He whispered across the invisible tether of magic he had created. The tower is the entirety of the evil kingdom. Every human in the world lives inside, and that is where they keep all their gold. The magic tether snapped. Gullen opened his eyes and stared into the sun. He sighed. I'm sorry I failed you all. But then he saw the white dragon arc back into the sky and race west toward the outpost. Gullen smiled as he watched the powerful monster approach. His smile faded and he dropped back down inside the tower. The trap door stuck to the carbon for a moment, but he pulled it free and slammed the door closed. Golan ran down the stairs as the flames licked across the outside of the outpost, heating the inside like a kiln. One of the windows blew open on the level below him. Golan held up as the fire poured through against the opposite wall, charring the stone. The fire sputtered off, and Golan leapt over the sizzling steps beside the window. The flame belched through the opening again behind him, and Golan screamed. Holes burnt through the back of his robes, and the, fl and the flesh of his back blistered. Let's say as the flesh of his back blistered. Because we don't want him to think there's holes in his back. That's kind of how that sentence reads. All right, as the flesh of his back blistered. He tried to hold the wall against him, beside him for balance, but the heat of the stone burned his hands. He staggered down the spiral. The dragon struck the outside of the tower with his body and claws, shaking the entire structure. Gullen toppled and fell free down the center. He struck his chest on the edge of the next platform and barked out in pain. He dangled from his fingertips, heaving for air from his aching chest. The dragon roared and flame enveloped the tower again. Another window exploded inward. Twisted tongues of fire licked at Gullen's knuckles. He groaned and lost his grip. Gullen fell, fell the last couple stories and landed hard on his feet. His knees buckled and he slammed to the floor, knocking the wind out of him. Out of him, let's say himself. So we're focused on him out of himself one of his knees struck the pump pipe of the well with a loud pong Gullen rolled to his back and tried to suck air back into his lungs and failed he stared up through the tower above him flames sp spraying in through one broken window and then another on the opposite side the dragon roared and vibrated the floor under the wizard's battered body he heard the sound circle the tower outside as the onslaught continued. The air distorted from the heat, from the intense heat. Black spots danced through Gullen's vision like living things. His chest released and he drew in a painful gulp of hot air. Gullen rolled to his stomach and clutched the handle of the well pump that still felt cool in contrast to the oven heat of the tower. He worked the pump arm over and over, with one squeak after another. Water poured out across Gullen's back, stinging his wounds. He continued pumping a steady flow of water, soaking his ropes and puddling under him. In the curves of the flagstones, the water washed over his hair and dripped off his face as he breathed in the steam off the hot floor. Gullen continued pumping, trying to keep the unfiltered water out of his eyes and mouth. All right, scene break. Golan dropped the bandages away from his back and hands. The flesh felt tender, but the healing spells appeared to have worked. Golan sighed and picked up the scalpel again. He wrapped the wet blanket around his shoulders and over his head. 
he looked up through the splintered wood and broken platforms up through the chimney of of the tower through the broken trap door he could see a few of the stars he listened and heard the dragon rumble in the back of his white throat just outside the broken double doors behind him Gullin turned and looked at the piles of stone that covered the space left from the felled doors he could see gaps large enough for him to crawl out or for the dragon to breathe through he knew the dragon never slept and would soon be spewing fire inside again Golan would run up the stairs to escape as the dragon moved up to other openings Golan would run back down he would watch and dodge more stone falling away inside the tower which he would pile by the door to deter the dragon's next attack he knew he should be sleeping to replenish his magic energy but it wouldn't matter much since his food supply was scorched and he barely had time to treat enough to treat enough water to keep himself alive Golan turned back to the wall and carved the scalpel through the thick soot on the stone he continued the curve he continued the curved lines of the scales as he as his rendition of the creature outside scales of his rendition of the creature outside he wondered if anyone would see it eventually the dragon would break through to what Gullen had purposely convinced him was the kingdom he sought he moved the scalpel back to the head and added sharpness to the fans around the skull the dark negative image of his nemesis did not do justice to the grandeur of his stark white body Gullen did not have his inks any longer to give a more realistic portrait looks like i won't outlive the guild illustrators after all cal right. four the tone of the dragon's rumble shifted outside Golan raised his head and listened to see if he needed to run up the spire again like a rat in a trap even the rats were smarter than me and escaped the beast the rumble dropped back down to the low sounds of rest Golan sighed and went back to carving he sat back and admired his work Golan leaned in over the dragon and carved in block letters above the etching in the same style as the warning above the doors dragons live prepare for them while you still can he set the scalpel back on the floor with a click Golan swallowed on his dry throat i truly wish you were here right now calfor the dragon's growl grew and light billowed outside brightening Golan's work Golan stood and looked up the stairs he prepared to run but did not move he looked out at the flames above the stone blocking the door he remained still facing the monster and waiting Golan had no children counting on his survival as his own father had except all the children of this kingdom if this dragon breaks in and finds there is no gold he will go looking for more Golan looked up through the tower and considered his options they will tell my mother and sisters I, it was my fault the dragons the dragon got past to attack the kingdom he closed his eyes and whispered the ether the ethereal words hearing them echo doubly off the ether of the universe and the burnt stone that surrounded him the connection drove Golan to his knees blood poured from his nose and ears he pictured himself scrambling backward to keep from being swallowed in the dimensional complexity of the ancient mind so close to Gullen. he felt the dark slits of the eyes staring at him through the physical air and along the tether of the ether who are you to visit inside my mind evil plague upon my kind tiny parasite that hath wrought destruction upon my ancestors i shall sleep upon your precious gold painted with your blood Golan clutched the sides of his own skull as the ancient languages screamed at him in other phrases he could not process Golan whispered i am i am no one i am the last man in the world and you have defeated me then why do i still see you and feel you in my mind i am a spirit and nothing more you feel me upon the ether in your supreme victory now that i am gone you have finally avenged all the death man has visited upon your kind you live and we are no more the gold of all the fallen kingdoms of man are within this tower they are melted black into the walls by your fiery breath claw through the top crawl inside and claim the ret and claim the rest upon the gold which you have earned in your righteous vengeance the dragon the dragon roared and soared up above the tower the tether broke and Golan slumped to the floor the tower shook with the impact and broken stone rained down around Golan. 
He spit out rubble dust and rolled to his belly. He crawled out from under the blanket and scaled the stone pile the stone piled over the door. A large chunk of stone landed on the discarded blanket and exploded. Gullen tumbled out of the doorway and landed on his back, staring up at the stars and the whipping tail of the ma massive white dragon above the tower. Stone fell around him outside. Gullen staggered to his feet and ran up the trail away from the tower. He heard an explosion. Gullen stopped and turned to see the top of the tower missing. The walls split as the dragon forced his body down inside the tower. The dragon roared once more as Gullen stared at the white scales pressed against the openings of the small windows. He heard the low rumble inside as the dragon became still. Gullen bowed his head and turned toward the east. He walked toward the border of the kingdom during the night, watching... Okay, I may need a little break here, because this is a little... Gullen bowed his head and started toward the east. Let's make this a new paragraph. He walked toward the border of the kingdom during the night. Let me put in during the night first. During the night... He walked toward the border of the kingdom. Watching carefully to stay on the trail in the dark. Golan passed, paused to rest and looked back at the ruins of the dark tower at a great distance. The white dragon remained hidden and sleeping inside as the young magic user had hoped. Golan whispered, slumber, ancient one, we have both earned it. He turned and continued his trek back to the green kingdom. He intended to visit the guild first and request Calfor's assistance with the king's warriors on the return quest to finish the dragon. You deserve to see this, old master. He thought it only fitting after all of the Elder Wizard's years of keeping diligent watch. All right, and that is Hixent Draconis. So that was a little better than I expected. Um, again, like I said, it was an older work, and I thought... It may be a little more shaky. It's not perfect, and it's maybe not be for. It may not be for all fantasy fans, uh, but I think it holds up as a story. It has a good beginning, middle, and end. I like the fact that the um, they still they don't believe in dragons, but one shows up. Um, I, I like the way that I um, develop the magic. One thing about magic, you kind of have to have rules that sort of work, and it felt a little unique. No, I didn't write all that in one day. That was that was probably several days. Um, but I I kind of like the way I I developed that magic. So it's it's not it's not exactly like um, other fantasy stories. And there's sort of a internal rules of it. So magic users are expending power. There's sort of this ether behind the world that magic plays off of. Um, I I was trying to make the um, the dragon's mind something a little bit alien so that uh, human minds would struggle with it. And I think it worked out well. I kind of like the idea of this young magic user on his first assignment having to figure out how to outsmart a dragon since he can't actually kill one. So that is a story that's going to appear um, in 31 stories for Halloween um, on my Patreon page. And of course you guys got to see it first for free. And um, it's one that I wanted to actually do a while ago uh, when I was first getting onto Twitch. And then uh, my, my equipment didn't quite stay up to, to par. I was using the camera over my laptop and that went out. And so finally I kind of have a good setup here where I can do this more regularly. I uh, appreciate you guys jumping in on the uh, chat and watching. Or my I find the rules of magic are much more well-formed in fantasy as opposed to urban fantasy where they just yell a word and blast fireballs all day long. Uh, I've read some good urban fantasy. Um, some of it is kind of bled over into sort of um, young adult territory and uh, hinging on romance a little bit too. And so, um, yeah, you do get... And you find that in fantasy too, I think. Um, there's There's plenty of fantasy writers that have the magic work a little too easily too. Uh, I'm try I try to be careful about that if I'm ever using something along those lines. But I think I'm guilty of just having magic work a little a little too easy sometimes too. Um, 
So I appreciate you guys uh, watching in, and uh, I'll see you again soon.